Thank you for dropping by for my late in the day on Sunday, July 21st message. And this is from the eighth chapter of Daniel. This is important stuff. The title of it is called The Spirit of Antichrist. A lot of confusing stuff that we will unravel for you in this message. Daniel chapter eight, The Spirit of Antichrist. Now, I hope you subscribe to my channel. I hope you'll Hit the bell so you get notified every time I put something out. I put stuff out every day. Daily devotions, messages, shorts, where just a Bible thought. I put a bunch of those out. And if you put a prayer request in the notes, in the uh, comments, I'll put out a prayer video, get a hundred, hundreds of people praying for you, okay? I teach the Bible here. And uh, I've been doing this for 51 years. And I started doing this on YouTube about four years ago. And uh, I put stuff out every day, my daily devotions, all kinds of things. So I hope you subscribe and hit the bell and share it with someone else. We teach the Bible that could change their life forever, okay? Every time the Bible gets open, that happens. Daniel, the eighth chapter, the spirit of Antichrist. Let's pray and we'll jump into it. Father, I pray that you would speak to us through the eighth chapter of Daniel. Crawl inside my life again with this chapter and change it. And crawl inside everybody else's life with the power of the Holy Spirit by the truth of your word and change our lives into what you had in mind for us to be. For I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel is going to relate to us a dream he had. And it was the third year of King Belshazzar's reign. This is one of the kings down, down a ways from uh, the original king, which was Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel goes back to a time just before chapter 5 of Daniel with his dream. He's in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam and was beside the Uli River. He's in this, basically this says that he is in the second largest city in ancient Babylon. Okay, now before Daniel is done with this dream, we will see three things. First, we will see the Antichrist the world has dealt with then the Antichrist the world will deal with, and the spirit of Antichrist that we're dealing with now. All this stuff about the Antichrist will unravel it in the book of Daniel. Everything Daniel sees is prophecy that has not happened, okay? This is predictive. I like to, I call it pre-recorded history because it's going to happen, and it has. In other words, when he wrote these things, they had not yet happened yet. As you will see, they will they have happened. By now they've happened, and more will happen. Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 through 27 is where we found this. It's a good idea to go back and read it. Not going to take the time to read it on, on the YouTube channel. It takes up so much time, it's uh, it's hard to get it up on the channel after I, after I spend extra time. So read it. It'll be a blessing to you. First, he sees a ram with two horns, and one of the horns grew larger than the other. The ram represents the kings of Medo-Persia. Uh, one grew larger, one, one grew longer than the other, and it represents Persia being dominant, and it was. Next, a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes comes from the west. This goat charged the ram with great rage, knocking him to the ground, and no one could stand against the goat. The goat stands for Greece under Alexander the Great, who conquered Medo-Persia with great power and with speed and with military strategy. Phenomenal uh, commander, Alexander the Great. Uh, verse 8 of Daniel 8 describes Alexander the Great becoming very, very powerful. When at the height of his power, the one horn was broken off, and replaced by four horn, horns. In the Bible, horns are always about power. They represent power. Alexander died in his 30s, and the kingdom was divided four ways under Ptolemy I over Egypt and Palestine, Seleucia over Babylonia and Syria, and Lysimachus over Asia Minor, and Antipater over Macedonia and Greece. It was broken off in four kingdoms, developed out of um, Alexander's kingdom. So out of the four horns grew another horn that started small but grew in power to the south and east toward the beautiful land, which is Israel. Israel is the beautiful land. This is a guy that is known as Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes, who would rule and would be powerful and would be ruthless. Daniel 8 verse 12 describes Antiochus Epiphanes. Because of rebellion, 
the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice would be given over to it. It prospered in everything it did. The truth was thrown to the ground. This is saying that Antiochus Epiphanes would take Jerusalem and take over the temple and set up heathen worship in it, and he did. That happened. That, that this is predicting that it will happen again. This is pre-recorded history, it's telling us what's going to happen in the future, and it happened because we now live after that time. Antiochus Epiphanes was devastating and defeated the people of God for a time. He was deceitful. He considered himself superior. You know, in fact, he considered himself God falsely. He was a false god. A lot of rulers are. Daniel 8.25d tells us, the last part of that verse, uh, tells us his end. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. Okay, he went insane. You know, this God afflicted him with this because he's so evil. He went insane and died in 164 BC. This is the Antichrist the world has dealt with already. He is a type of or a prediction of the Antichrist that will come at the end of the age. So he is the Antichrist that the world has already dealt with. But there will be more at the end of time. God sent the angel Gabriel to explain the dream to Daniel. We pick up the history in Daniel 8, verse 17. As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. The son, prostrate. son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. G Gabriel was telling Daniel that the vision of Antiochus Epiphanes predicts his coming, but, it's, but states that the Antichrist will come at the end times. That's important. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 deals with the man of lawlessness, or I believe he is, he's talking about the Antichrist. It says this, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshiped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Here the apostle Paul is calming some believers, calming them down, uh, because some people were claiming that some believers had come down and were that they were claiming that they'd missed the second coming, that Jesus had come back and these dudes had missed it. That's a bunch of nonsense. He is saying that Jesus will return after the man of lawlessness or after the Antichrist sets him up in God's temple as, as God and proclaims himself as God. And he's talking about that happening at the end of time, which is coming. It hasn't happened yet. Antiochus Epiphanes is predictive of the Antichrist because he did the same thing, and it looks forward to that. In the last 50 years or so, I've heard Christians accuse many people of being the Antichrist. I get that in comments today in my YouTube channel. Oh, so-and-so's the Antichrist. Saddam Hussein got the finger pointed at him, and many others have said, he's the Antichrist. One time some guy came out and said, a lot of people were saying this, I don't know why, they're saying that Henry Kissinger is the Antichrist. Where did that come from? That's quackadoodle. That's crazy. When the guy shows up who does what Antiochus Epiphanes did, then you have the Antichrist and get ready for Jesus' return. That hadn't happened yet. Set himself up in God's temple, called himself God. That has not happened again near the end of times where we are today. But you know what? When it does, it will be unmistakable. And it won't be Saddam Hussein. It won't be Henry Kissinger or any other crazy stuff like that. It will be the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, and it will be without mistake. You won't be able to miss it. It'll be so obvious, especially if you have the Holy Spirit in your life. This is the Antichrist the world will deal with, but hasn't dealt with yet. Okay, now let's take a look at the spirit of Antichrist we're dealing with right now. This happens to us all the time. In John chapter 7, it says this, 2 John chapter 7, it says, Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. See, if a person who does not confess Jesus as coming in the flesh 
is influencing people away from Jesus who came in the flesh. He's the Antichrist. There's all kinds of those around. The spirit of Antichrist is alive and well on planet Earth and always has been, okay, and will be until the end, until the end comes. The other basic element is the spirit of Antichrist is deception and opposition to the things of God and the teaching of Christ. It will oppose it. I get that opposition all the time in comments on my YouTube channel. People believe the craziest stuff, but that's the spirit of Antichrist. It is all over the place. It is in cultic religions, and on and on it goes. Look at 2 John 9. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Why do I teach expositorily from the Scriptures? We need to continue in the teaching, and we need to lead others to continue in the teaching. Critically important critically important. Needs to be a big dose of it. It's why I do this on a YouTube channel and in my ministry everywhere. It's why I'll be preaching expository ter- sermons as I become the pastor at Lindsay Christian Church. The spirit of Antichrist is denial of Christ, deceiving people about him, and not continuing in the teaching of Christ. That happens continually today among people who think they're the church, and they're not. Not if they are not continuing in the teaching of Christ. Recently, a very prominent pastor said the following, it's too late for America. We've legalized sin. I kind of agree with that. We have legalized sin, but I don't agree that it's too late for America. You know why? Because America can repent. We're in a time where we are passing laws that enable ungodliness. That happens with the Biden administration all the time. You know, my wife and I married in April 6th, 1973. We've been Married a little over 51 years. That's the same year Roe versus Wade made it through the Supreme Court, making abortion legal in the country. Now, since then, we've probably killed 70 million unborn children. That may be, may be the most obvious expression of Antichrist that there is. People don't have to like that, but it's the truth. Now, and I know that Roe versus Wade has been overturned and that that's sent back to the states. And I'm, I'm grateful that. I'm grateful for that. But there are more abortions today than there were before Roe was overturned. Did you know that? There are. Uh, I know abortions that were done to girls when I was in high school. That was in the 60s. I was a teen in the mid-60s. It, it's horrible. It's been going on for all, all of time. It still goes on today. It is immoral. And it, it's immoral for, a, for, the, for the states that have laws that make it legal. That's immoral. Okay. It's immoral. Laws that allow that to kill babies in the womb are immoral. They're immoral. And it is a, a, a sign of the end of the times, a sign of the spirit of Antichrist. Same sex marriage is legal in most states. Did same sex people cohabitate, cohabitate before it was legal? Of course they did. They've been doing that forever. It, it is problematic for the laws of a nation to make it legal. We should not. But we have, and it, it's wrong. Some on TV said that they recognized 127 genders. You know how, what a bunch of nonsense that is? There's two genders. God made them male and female. That's it. You're either a male or you're a female. If you say you're something else, you're dazed and confused. You, you're a, and you're, you've dropped off into sinful behavior, and you've been deceived by the spirit of Antichrist. We are so confused, we can't figure out whether a person is a boy or a girl. And that goes on constantly all the time. The problem is that we define what is true by what someone feels or thinks, not biology, which was made by God, which was made by God. We miss that. Not by, and we don't define things by his word, which is what God said and is objective truth. Two things are objective truth, creation and God's word. And just because some dude says something doesn't make it true. And it can be deceptive. And when it is, it's the spirit of Antichrist. Truth can always be chased back to God in one of two ways, either by his creation or his word in the Bible. Subjective truth is accepted and taught in our schools and colleges. And it is it is not based on objectivity, which means that you got to be able to chase it back to God. And when you can chase it back to God, then it could, it'll be one of two things, either creation 
It'll be functional in creation, or it will be word from God. If you can't chase it back to God, it's not necessarily objective truth. Congress has been trying to pass laws that say if a boy identifies as a girl, he can shower with the girls at school. The best word I can think of for that is, okay, this is a great theological word, horse feathers. That's horse feathers. Horse feathers. It's nonsense. Now listen, if you told the guys when I went to high school, you know, this is in the mid-60s, if you told the guys I went to high school with that they could identify as a girl, they could shower with the girls, you know what they'd do? They'd identify as, as girls so they could shower with the girls, so they could see naked girls. That's what that goes on today. That's stupid. It's amazing that we're that, that's the spirit of Antichrist in the world. It goes on all the time. 1970, 10% of babies were born out of wedlock. Today, 60% of babies are born without married parents. In the year 2000, 75% of Americans were church members. Today, 47% of Americans are church members. Wow, we're going the wrong direction. Why the spirit of Antichrist is working us over? The spirit of Antichrist is hammering us. And we need, you know what? We need to teach the Bible and pray our way out of it. We need to be very, very passionate and consistent. Remember that the spirit of Antichrist is in Antiochus Epiphanes died suddenly. Remember that the Antichrist at the end of time will be thrown into the lake of fire. He loses. He does not win. He loses. Why can't America defeat him and have a comeback? We can. Listen, if Jesus can raise Tom West from the death of sin and destruction, which he did, he can raise America from the defeat by the spirit of Antichrist. He can raise us from the dead, and we need to be raised from the dead. America needs that. If the Lord can raise the dead, and he can, then he can raise America from the dead, and I believe he will. We need to pray for it. We need revival in the church and in the culture. Ask God for revival in the church and the culture. You know what happened needs before we get revival? We need repentance in the church and in the culture that can lead to revival. Focus on Jesus, not your brand of church. At your church, focus on Jesus, not your brand of church. Have Good Friday and Easter every day, not just on Good Friday and Easter. When Jesus died and was raised from the dead, focus on that all the time. Be focused on Christ's death to pay for sin and his bodily resurrection to beat death. Be focused on those things all the time. Why? Because it's the opposite of the spirit of Antichrist. Don't talk about prayer. Pray. Pray in groups. Pray alone. Do prayer drills. Do Bible study and prayer. Teach the Bible. Pray, pray, pray. The longer I live, which is stacking up, it's 75 and a half years, the longer I live, the more passionate I become about praying. Ask yourself what difference Christ has made in your life. Then tell others what he's done for you. Learn how to lead a person to the Lord. And you know what? Don't talk about it. Do it. Learn how to lead a person to the Lord and do it. Churches need to exist to keep Jesus happy, not exist to keep the church happy. And if we decide that we're going to exist to keep Jesus happy, Jesus is happy when the lost are found. There's a whole bunch of lost that need to be found. We need to bring that before the Lord in prayer and then do all we can to proclaim the good news to the whole world. Jesus died on the cross to save people. His body, the church, should exist for the same purpose, to get people to Christ and saved. Churches need to quit fussing about how to worship God and, mu and, and, and what music to use and start worshiping God. That's what needs to happen. I'm, I'm sorrowful about the influence of the Antichrist. It wounds my heart. I can easily worry about the influence of Antichrist on America. But what we all need to do is to look to Christ for revival, for repentance and revival. Sorrow looks back. Worry looks around. Faith looks up to Jesus. That's what we need to do. When we look up to Jesus, even the spirit of Antichrist working us over, when, when we look up to Jesus with the spirit of Antichrist working us over, even, even in the midst of the, those hard times, we can still claim Romans 8, 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We can be conquerors through Christ who loved us. Meaning, 
that we, with the power of Christ, can thump the spirit of Antichrist operating in our world today. We need to go there, folks. Join me. We'll go there. Let's pray. Father, give us the passion and the power to defeat the spirit of Antichrist in our time and see repentance and revival for your church in America. I pray it in Jesus' name and around the world, for that matter, Lord. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.